Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves started today with session 11 of 1.8 to 2.8. Uh, today we're going to kind of try to wrap up some of our work thinking about structural systems. We're going to take a look at some very basic little structural models and think about how you can actually apply loads to them and do some analysis on them. So kind of the tail end of the whole structural analysis and kind of design loop um, where you can go through and uh, validate whether the sizes you assumed are appropriate and then use the structural analysis tool to choose new sizes and reintegrate those back into your model. What we're going to be doing today is really, it's kind of completing the loop from the standpoint of how the overall process works. I'll advocate that for what we do here, if we want to think about applying it to your own building designs, that we really go to focus on a very small portion of the project like really just a few bays, or maybe a worst case scenario of one or two beams that are really the most heavily loaded or the longest span, or something like that. Because some of what we're going to be doing today is really you know, quite involved. If you were really going to go through and do this for the complete structure, you, know, you could easily spend three or four weeks just doing that, or put a whole class together in terms of heading, something like that. So we'll demonstrate some things. I want you to be aware of how it works and see how all the good modeling tools flow together with the analysis tools. But think about what we're doing today. You know, you'll be doing it with a relatively light touch you know, for your own project in terms of thinking about you know, how it applies. The overall strategy, you want to be good on that. But in terms of whether you can do the detailed analysis, it just kind of varies with everyone's kind of time and availability and like all that stuff. OK. So let's think about high level, just where we are relative to different processes. In terms of the integrative design project, where we sure it sort of should be in the process is when you're meeting with us this week, you should have a pretty good sense of where the structural framing elements are. I think a lot of people were in really good shape last week, thinking about really where the major beams, columns, beam systems, some of those different things are. And really for this next week, we want to really kind of push it forward in two different dimensions. One is we'll be thinking about your different structures in terms of lateral support, so thinking about how you're providing that, whether you're thinking about braces or some sort of a shear wall or uh, just some sort of you know, moment frame, something like that, how we can model some of those things. But it's thinking about how lateral plays into it. And we'll also be thinking about just the structural sizing. And again, really more thinking about like a few specific elements that we can try to size as opposed to doing the entire structure, because there's really a lot of work in terms of doing that. But for the most part, by the end of this week, a really good goal, or coming in the next week, would be to sort of say that, hey, our structure is as complete as it's going to be for this project. You know, they're never quite, nothing's ever completely complete in this project. But really, we want to be shifting your attention then to thinking more about mechanical systems, some of the systems that are running inside the structure, mechanical and plumbing and all that. So think about just really trying to get your structure as nailed down as you can, you know, for this time. Um, there are some check-in times posted now, as well as there'll be some more added to it. The pattern of doing Tuesdays and Thursdays seems to work out pretty well, with maybe some additional ones on a Wednesday for people who can't make those times. But it looks like right now, the only times that are signed up for are 3.30 this afternoon and then 3 Thursday on, 3.30 on Thursday. So there's some more time slots available. So based on your readiness and availability, please go ahead and kind of sign up for some of those. And I recognize and definitely allow for the whole notion that since it is sort of the wrap-up week for Global AEC, there's a lot of things going on this week where it's even hard to find a place to sit in the building these few days. So, uh, you know, we're aware of that. Now, in terms of if this week's looking a little bit crowded for you relative to all your other commitments, um, as long as you keep things moving along and you're feeling relatively good for next week, you know, go ahead and use the time in the way you need to use it the best. So plenty of times available today, also on Thursday. I think we'll probably add some more on Wednesday. So if you see Gustavo and Nikos, we'll talk about adding some more in there, maybe even some on Friday. But if you're ready, come on in and uh, talk to us. Don't worry about that, because it's not HVAC, it's a personal finishing up structure. Hey, let us go back to the other thing that's going to hang around. Um, there's the little practice exercise that is still out there. I think a lot of people have gotten that turned in so far. But it was really just the whole idea of going through and doing a sample structure of framing in two of the different sort of structural systems. Let me sort of find it. It's back over here. Okay, 
so it's down there. It was nominally due, what was it, last night, something like that. But you know, for all these things, again, adapt to the time that you need to like go through and do it. I'm never very hard about the deadlines. And just in the overall sense of priority between the two different things, definitely spend your time really on the design project itself. These are really just an opportunity to you know, just you know, exercise uh, the placement of the different elements in the model. It's a little less complicated than your own model. So I just need the experience with the modeling tools. But yeah, that's out there hanging around too. But try and get them sort of uh, knocked out. We'll adjust that so it's sort of uh, uh, in terms of my timing of all these things. And, uh, the dates are sort of adjust a little bit because I think we're not quite to HVAC systems yet. We're still kind of finishing up structure and that's kind of okay. Okay, back over to the outline and what we're talking about today. So. The idea is what we want to start out talking about is just really the whole notion of structural analysis and how we prepare for that. Although, let me, before we even kind of dive into that, let me go through and put in just a little bit on sort of lateral systems. And think about those. So, what we're typically be are concerned with when we start thinking about, you know, the lateral systems is really the other types of loads. We've been thinking a lot about gravity loads, so loads that are kind of carrying straight on down, where we're really trying to support either more uh, dead loads from the roof, or from the floor, or the people loads, things like that. But it's all about the gravity for the lateral systems. We tend to be thinking more about how we resist uh, wind loads, seismic loads, just loads that are moving sideways, and sometimes a little more dynamic. So if we want to go through and take a look at how we can support those, what we tend to do is we you know, have a couple of different uh, strategies that we can use to go through and can uh, use them to resist. We can go ahead and use sort of shear walls or panels. Okay, we put a solid element that's going to resist the racking motion. Okay. We can go ahead and use bracing or we can go ahead and use moment frames. And let's go ahead and just take a look at how you model each of those. We'll start with sort of a very simple little structural model and for doing that, let's even go ahead and, oh, we'll open up the one we're going to use for the analysis, but we'll use it for this too. How about if we go to Revit and we open up in session 11, you have some uh, structural analysis models. Let's see if we can kind of open one of those and use it as the basis for our discussion. So we'll go ahead and, where is Revit? Actually, I have it kind of hiding below the window. I shouldn't have done that. We'll do a full screen action. That'll fix that. So we're going to be looking at a very simple little example. I like to work with very simple examples at first just because as we are working along and trying to understand how all these different tools work together, uh, a lot of times it gets confusing. And if the complexity of the model sort of uh, makes it hard to figure out whether or not we're getting accurate results or not, you're sort of stuck. So it's better typically to start with something so, so simple that anyone can sort of predict the behavior. So what I'll do is I'll go through and open up from session 11, when I get a chance here. Okay, go on out. Session 11 for you, 10 still for me. Let's go ahead and open up these Revit models, and I'm going to open up this little steel frame model.
So what you're going to see is this is a very simple model. This model only has basically one bay. It has four columns, some beams, and a beam system. But it's enough to get us going. model, I'm sort of looking at what's called the analytical model right now. Let me pop it back to the 3D model where you actually see the spatial elements. And that may be more what you're used to looking at. I have some basic columns in there, I have some beams, I have some footing elements. This one's actually all loaded up and ready to go. So uh, let me go ahead and just talk about the lateral stuff and then we'll talk about how we get this to this sort of state. Okay. In terms of thinking about lateral resistance, the idea is as follows. If I look at this thing, and I think about how it's going to go through and resist the loads, there's a couple of different ways I can sort of approach this. In terms of the sideways loads that may come on here, whether they're the wind or the seismic loads, yeah, they're going to tend to push sideways in a column, which is sort of simply framed like this. Okay, if there's no moment connections in here, everything's just sort of thin, we'll just rack and fall over. So we want to put in some elements that are going to resist that. So we have a couple of different choices. A really common way to go through and do that is to put in some sort of a bracing system. And where those live in the world of Revit is under the Structure tab, you have braces. So braces can either be sort of K braces or X braces, just sort of whatever makes the most sense to you. But the way they tend to work is as follows. You choose a brace. You choose some sort of a member, whether it's one of these wide flange members or one of these hollow steel members, sort of whatever is the appropriate kind of member you want to try. And what we'll do is we'll go through and try to basically, I'll turn on 3D snapping, connect from the end points of the different elements, kind of back up to sort of midpoints along the way. So let me go switch it back over to the analytical model because it's a little bit easier to connect this way. As I go through and I look at the analytical model, it's really easy to go through. I'm going to take that back. It's easy to see what we're getting at. I'm going to see whether or not it actually can snap to it. It doesn't look like it wants to. OK, I'll go back here. Brace, 3D snapping. I'll go from the base of this column right here. I'll come on up here to, oh, if I wanted to do like an X brace, I could come over here to the top of this bring that across. I can do the same thing sort of back in this direction. Now, this is not spatially accurate right now. In that, you see you have these intersecting tube elements, even up here at the top, where these braces are coming up and connecting to the tops of the columns. You got some sort of messiness going on there. It doesn't look very good. Analytically, it's correct. It's just spatially, it's not very well represented. We want to go through and clean up each of those different corners. We want to sort of put some sort of, there could be some gusset plates that join those together in the center to kind of make that X connection. Over here, there's probably some sort of plate where that's going to come in and tie into the bottom of that beam. But we can go ahead and clean those up, but typically it's not critical to go through and do that. If you're looking at it analytically, okay, it actually is what needs to happen. Especially if you want to clean that up, you can sort of play games like this. We could go through and, oh, there's this game of if you choose one of these members, you could try coping the member. And what I always have to think about this is the direction in which it happens. I always have to think about whether I choose the member that I cut with first or the member that I'm going to cut with adds coping to steel beams. Let's try it this way. I'm going to try that one and I'm going to try coping it to that one. Yep, it actually did it. Okay, so select the member and kind of cut it off. So again, I can do this and cope it to that. And try to get those cleaned up. Okay, again, that's just doing avoiding against it. It really doesn't do very much. It sort of cleans it up a little bit. Really, we still have to go back and design the detailed structural steel connection about how all that fits together. Okay, but if it makes you feel better, you're just going to see it'll be a little bit cleaner to go through and clean it up that way. Yeah, typical, you know, that it shows up in a rendering somewhere in the view 
where it's publicly visible and stuff like that. So, okay, it's good. so we can go through and come up with these, oh, like that, uh, X braces. Another very common strategy, though, is if you don't want big X braces cutting across like that, you can use what I call a K brace. I should find out what you guys call it. Where I go from the bottom here, and I'll try to go up to the midpoint over here. It's a little bit tricky there in terms of where the midpoint is versus where that beam system is. Okay. But now I have a brace there. Now the idea of this fabulous structure that I braced over here is that I got this one side all braced. That's looking pretty good. And then all the words kind of came on that one side and only on that one side being great shape. But they don't. They tend to kind of come across the structure. So if you think about, oh, let me go back. Put it back the other way. All the different way loads could apply to this structure. We tend to want to brace it in both directions. And by that, I mean something like this. Come back over here. I have, in this case, this nice looking sort of like a brace on this side. The load's really going to come across the entire side here, though. So if I only brace it on that one side, the problem is it's going to be very strong over on the side closest to me. If it's going to be weak over on the other side, it will still wrap on the other side. So you put braces on both sides so they're balanced out. Okay. So what you tend to do is think about the major outer wall lines and try to use those as much as possible to do that resisting. So if I put one on this side and I need to put one over there, I should do that same sort of operation on the other side. Similarly, you can't guarantee that the wind loads or the uh, kind of seismic loads are going to come in a single direction. They might be coming from this direction instead. Okay. So I'll do that same sort of thing. I'll take some sort of brace or some sort of lateral resisting element, I guess is the better way to say it. And I'll go from here. Again, up to the midpoint, back over here. Okay. So the big thing is just to really think about having them in balance so that you don't get some sort of twisting or racking or something like that. Now, if you have a multi-day structure, you don't need to put them everywhere. Okay? You only need to put them in select locations. So, for example, let's try this as a starting point. I will just go through and draw some structure here. And this is going to be a little Z shaped structure. These are my columns. these columns, there's going to be a series of beams. And beam systems. Then you get the idea. Okay, so the question is, as we think about our lateral elements, where do they belong? Okay. So, I got all my loads, they're going to come in, we'll consider this way first. Okay, so let's put some lateral load elements in here. Where would you suggest? Peter's got an idea, I can tell. In the middle bay, probably on the top and on the bottom. It's interesting, that's actually a pretty good place, sort of in here somewhere? Mm, kind of. Not yeah. how I was thinking, but sure. Well, what are you thinking? I was thinking so there it's three bays across. Yep. I was thinking the middle one. So somewhere in here. Yeah. So right here and right here? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay. 
Now that's actually a pretty good location in terms of sort of being balanced. So again, we can think of that as being bracing. Well, kind of look at a second, that could be a sheer wall, that could be a moment frame, it could be a lot of different things. This is pretty good from the standpoint of it's nice and balanced, it's not gonna twist. I still have these like little hangy sides on the two ends that I have to worry about. So they'll need a little lateral reinforcement too. And what I'll probably do is have some over here. It may not be as long. There's a little bit less area in there, okay, but we'll need something there. And the way you can actually sort of think about this is really, as soon as you put those lines in there, you basically have at this point, these are considered like strong lines, like reactions. So what's gonna happen here is, if you think about this as though these were horizontal beams, like that's a beam across here, that's a beam across here, and that's a beam across here. The amount of load that you actually have to resist is related to the lengths. So here, if this is a simple beam, half of it would go here, and half of it would go here. Half from this side would go here, and half would go here. And similarly. So what ends up happening is if we distribute those yellow beams along there, the two middle ones actually get quite a bit of load to them because it's being contributed from two sides where these ones on the ends are really pretty lightly loaded. It's a very narrow span and uh, only coming from one side. So we go through and based on all this loading, this green loading and these beams that we essentially are creating, we figure out all that load being concentrated and applying and then we have to put enough lateral resistance in to produce that load. Okay, that's my real basic, you know, that's back of the napkin like a structural uh, like a lateral analysis. Okay. We'll do the similar sort of thing in the other direction because you know we have to go through and consider that the loads could come in that direction too. Actually the weird thing is we don't hardly ever think about it. It's like they could come diagonally. <laughs> they couldn't come from any direction. So I got all this load coming this way. And if I think about this, for example, if I put the, um, where most people will start is just on the outer edges. This tends to be sort of a good spot. You sort of want things to be in balance with each other because if things aren't in balance with each other, then you have this kind of like racking and twisting problem. So that might not be bad in terms of keeping those in balance. The question now is if I need those intermediate members and the way you sort of determine that is if you think about this whole floor diaphragm acting as a big plate or a beam, it's really, can that really transfer the loads all the way out to those endpoints? And if it's not enough, okay, then we'll add some intermediate members. Typically better to be in balance, but not always. Okay. Very often on the outsides of the building, we'll go through and put some sort of braces or stuff like that. The good news is that the, in the middle of the building is often you'll have that core. You'll have whether it's an elevator shaft or some sort of a concrete shaft that's running up and kind of providing some sort of a core that also turns out to be a really good element for you laterally because if you have that elevator shaft kind of hanging around right in here, all that concrete going up could actually provide quite a bit of lateral resistance too. Okay, so it's working to your advantage. So, we're gonna go through and think about this in terms of all these different ways. Okay, we looked at braces. Braces are sort of a good way to start out. But, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the other ones. Okay. If you prefer to think about this more in terms of there being sheer walls as opposed to there being braces, we can think about that too. For example, if you wanted to have a sheer wall which was supporting some of this, okay, if you are going to be creating concrete walls, what you can do is add in a wall element. If I go through and put a wall in, call it a wall structural, there's really not that big a difference. In fact, one of the few things is that little checkbox right there. But if I put in a structural wall, and 
Let's look at it back in 3D again. Hmm. Not a very good location for it. Okay, that might be a little bit better in terms of what's going on. If it is a big old concrete wall, a couple different things are working for us. A, we probably don't need that beam floating around in there since I could have those loads spared directly on the concrete. In terms of the wall itself, you get to sort of uh, say within the modeling tool how you want that to be considered. Yeah, you can choose basically uh, structural, structural usage. You get to say, is it shear or is it also bearing or shear and bearing combined? Okay, and that'll have a slightly different impact about whether we're going to think about that in terms of the gravity loads and how they're going to affect the wall or only the level loads or a combination of loads. But what happens is because you've gone ahead and turned on structural wall, when I take that now over to a structural analysis package like ETABS or robot structural, it'll be there. It'll be considered as one of the walls. Okay. Any walls that aren't structural, like won't be come through. So again, what that looks like is for most of your walls, I just drew some sort of an architectural wall out here. Actually, I'm in the structural view, so that's why you can't see it right now. Notice that wall doesn't show up. The reason is it's not structural. If you want it to show up, just make it structural. Okay, and when you make it structural, then it gives you all sorts of information about uh, the rebar cover and stuff like that. Okay, so if you already have walls, you can go ahead and use those. If you want to copy monitor walls, then that works too. But you can use walls. Now, if you are going to use walls for your structural support, we'll go through and add a little bit of uh, foundation support for them too because not only do you want to support the point loads, but you also want to support the load all along the wall. You have to kind of make sure that uh, the board is supported for the gravity loads and it doesn't slip. So we can say under structure, there's a wall footing. And we have different sizes and shapes of those. OK, now have this whole wall footing that kind of continued along there. So just kind of think about that in terms of what you're doing. If you have a lot of walls, in fact, I think about some structures like on, like Peter, your structure has all those concrete block walls. You probably have a big old wall footing like this all the way around the edges like that. I think Norbert, you'll probably have something similar in terms of you have all those concrete walls. Yeah. Well, it's interesting since you're inside of a cave. It's interesting about how that's going to work. Okay. But if you're going to have point loads versus kind of wall loads, it's going to have the foundations. So this is a real common way of doing that. It's just structural walls. The third variation I'll talk about is this. And it has to do with, oh, the notion that as you're going through and putting your fabulous looking structure together, you may or may not want to see all that structure. So very commonly, you'll go through and put a nice uh, kind of architectural wall out here. The architect in you wants to go through and put in some really nice curtain walls. So you put something like this all the way to the front across there. Change that back to turn on the curtain wall so you can see them. Got that beautiful piece of glass there. And as you're looking through that beautiful piece of glass, you're seeing all that steel, which may or may not be desirable. Like, I actually kind of like seeing the steel structure. If you kind of wander around in our building, to like the copy rooms, you can see the steel structure coming on down. If you're in the Wong Center, and you go down to the basement, you can sort of see the steel braces that go all the way up and down. I actually think it's kind of cool to see all that. But some people don't like to see all that. They like to hide the structure. So if you prefer to hide the structure and keep it so that it looks relatively clean, what you can do is actually just adjust these different kind of connections right here so that as opposed to being pinned connections, they have a little bit of a moment resistance to them and you can create a, basically a rigid frame that won't rack. Okay? And that's called a moment frame. And if you want to go through and create a moment frame, it's actually pretty easy. 
So what you gotta do is for each of these different members, let me just turn on the analytical model so you can just sort of see it there, is really just get to sort of adjusting its properties. So there actually is something right over here. Let's see if I can get the analytical beam. It's right there on the end. <coughs> The beam actually has this notion of really what its start and end conditions are. And if you want them to be moment resisting, okay, you can go ahead and turn that on. So as opposed to a pin connection, making it a bending moment connection. Okay. And then that'll be a little bit different when it comes to anal analyzing it, because as opposed to being a simply connected beam or simply supported beam, it'll actually transfer some of the moment back to the column, and the column will actually help resist and kind of keep things laterally straight actually put some new loads on the columns too. So any of that stuff is modelable kind of in the system. At a high level, I think for what you guys are up to, the big thing is really just think at a high level where your strategy is and where you're going to put those lateral resisting elements. Okay. Um, what happens for steel structures, you often have to kind of think very explicitly about putting some braces in there or some moment frames. Concrete structures, for the most part, they do a pretty good job of resisting lateral forces all on their own. So they uh, you know, tend to sort of uh, have it built right into the concrete themselves, although we might put some concrete shear walls in there just to kind of make sure that uh, you know, even concrete columns, if there's a bunch of skinny columns and they don't have any wall resistance, can kind of topple over. Yeah. Wood is actually another very kind of cool structural system. I do a lot of wood because I do a lot of residential construction. That's what most of my work is. So in wood, where does the ladder resistance come from there? Okay, if you are building sort of a wood frame house, and you have all those studs sticking up, all those two by fours, kind of at 16 inches or something like that, what keeps them from rocking over? Yeah. Gustavo knows. What are you thinking, Gustavo? The jib board helps a little. Actually, it does. In fact, on a lot of older houses, it was pretty much the jib board. That was about all that really held it up was the jib board. The, 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 the diaphragm of the gypsum wall board or something like that actually provided that. Nowadays, almost all wood frame structures, though, we put something on the outside. What do they typically put on the outside of a wood frame structure? Like if you go zipping by something that's being built right now, what do you see a lot of all over the USB Exactly, OSB or plywood. And we'll call that sheathing of some type. And that really serves two different purposes. One is that it provides backing for the uh, surface material so that you have like, a nice solid surface there. But actually, we put a lot of nails in that in very specific places to create sheer panels. Okay, And based on the amount of nailing, that's providing the lateral resistance. So very often, you cover them all with a lot of plywood. And the plywood is really what provides the lateral resistance. So. In, an app, in a typical wood frame uh, house, let me just go out and see if I can grab a picture of something interesting. You'll see things like this. Well, it's not a great picture, but what's happening there, that's OSB, oriented strand board. Let me go back to another picture. I want to get something good looking here. Actually, you can even see it in here. I don't want to get plywood there. Actually, you can sort of see it. Where's all the good pictures when you need them? A lot of plywood all over the exterior surface. Again, it's not only supplying, supporting the stucco that's going to be on the outside there, it's actually going to go through and just provide the lateral resistance. And it really all comes down to the nailing. If we nail it in tightly, these actually become very rigid panels, and they can't go ahead and rack over. So that tends to be a pretty good strategy. Okay, and that's what we'll typically use on most of our residential construction. Now, in terms, let's think of this picture. 
This is another one. Very tall building there. But again, this is a lot of oriented strand board. You see all the plywood over there is kind of covering things up. Now, if you are an architect and you're thinking, hey, okay, I need to provide this lateral resistance, and clearly the solution is to put plywood all over the entire building, okay, that might be sort of rubbing you the wrong way in terms of thinking about all that glass you want to put in the building. Because there's a trade off. Everywhere you put that plywood, you're going to get this lateral resistance. But if you have a lot of uh, very glassy surfaces, surfaces that don't really offer a lot of places to put plywood, you need someplace else to go through and put that resistance. Okay. And that lends itself to the whole idea of, again, using a frame. But let me show you what those look like when you uh, tend to work with them. Okay. That's like a little moment resisting frame right now. So what's happening here, you can sort of see steel columns. You sort of see a steel beam in here. You see some uh, plates on the ends. That thing is really going to be very strong. It's not going to wrap over sideways. Can you, can you sort of imagine where that's going to be used? It's a, sort of a very common condition that most of us have on the front of our houses. If you think about most houses, where's the weakest wall of all the different walls? And which wall has the biggest opening? What's that? Right the garage. It's almost always the garage. So right around the garages, you tend to have big openings. You tend not to have very much wall to work with, so you put these frames in there typically. Okay. And that's sort of a very common way of doing it. Okay. Let me give you one more picture, and then we'll get back to the modeling over here. frames are a really good way to do that. So it's just another technology for doing that. But how we model that is, again, just come back over here and we put in structural panels. So even if I want to put a structural wall in here and I don't want to put it across the entire length, what I can do is say, great, okay, I'm going to put a structural wall in here, not for the entire length, I'm just going to put one, oh, about this far. Actually, that's a curtain wall. That's not going to be very good on my structural side. This could be a concrete wall. Again, I need to get it up to the right level. Okay, and that little bit of wall may be enough to go ahead and provide all the resistance of putting plywood across the entire length there. And I'll put a foundation on it. Okay. So I won't get into too much depth about all of this, but basically know that you want to think about where your uh, lateral walls are. And just as we talk about your structure, kind of, uh, you know, just think about really which strategy is preparing the goal down. But, you know, we may not get into very detailed modeling, but if you want to start doing the modeling, it's simply you're going to be braces, frames, walls, something like that for the character. Okay, so sort of makes sense? Excellent. Then 
let us go ahead and leave that behind and still talk about the whole issue of just the actual structural frame or uh, analysis and how that works. So I'm going to go ahead and close this one up just because I've been messing around with it a little bit and talk about, oh, what it is that we need to go through and do to get things ready for structural analysis. Let's come back over to Revit, or to the mind map. There it is. Typically what we're gonna do is add just a couple of things to it to really get the analytical model ready for applying and doing analysis to it. We're gonna think about any of the floors that are structural. So if you have floors and you need to carry loads, Turn on the structural property of those. We also need to kind of think about any walls that we want to consider to be structural. Turn those on. Okay. Then we're going to add a combination of boundary conditions and loads. And we'll show you each of those work. Boundary conditions are those are things that we put in place to keep the structure from moving and provide resistance. We okay. typically put those under foundations because that's where we sort of say that it's not going to move any further. Then we apply some combination of loads. So let's take a look at what that looks like in Revit. If you go back in, and maybe I'll open up the concrete one instead. Or the steel one, doesn't really matter. If I go back to, I can do either looking at it for concrete or steel. The idea is somewhere in this model, Open up. Take it, it's time. Okay, we're always going to have two different models, actually the same model, just two different views of it. One is what I'll call the spatial model, and the other is called the analytical model. In this model, you can actually see the true sizes of all the elements. So you can see all the different concrete members, you can see uh, the little cross beams, things like that. If I go to analytical model, okay, I'm looking at just a line drawing representation of the same thing. As you place all your columns and your beams and stuff like that, you're actually creating the analytical model as you go. You don't think about it, but it's actually happening as you go. And really what we want to do is make sure that all the lines are connected so that everything is understood as being connected. And then we'll talk about sort of some of the specific changes that sort of make this happen. The floor right now, or the roof of this, what looks like the roof over here, okay, uh, is currently brown right now, that's indicating that it's a structural floor. Let me come back over here to the analytical model. If I take a look at that floor, see if I can get to it, maybe I'll shade it so you can see it better. There's the floor. If it has structural turned on, Go back over to the analytical model. Okay. If structure is turned off, it no longer shows up. If structure is turned on, that does show up. But every floor has the option of either being structural or non-structural. So in general, you want your floors to be structural. It's interesting. Roofs can't be structural. So what we want when we model model roofs and carry loads, we'll either sort of model them as floors or we'll model them as just the beams and apply the loads directly to the beams. Okay, but it's an interesting thing. Roofs themselves don't actually sort of carry the structural property. So I'll come back over here to the 3D model and choose that floor again. I go through and say, hey, let's go ahead and make it structural. Notice when I make it structural, it now picks up the whole notion of enabling the analytical model. And it'll go through and give us a little data about sort of the rebar and coverage. Now the difference between the structural or non-structural is this. If I turn it off again, and I come back over here and I say I want to apply loads, okay, it's not there. It's not available to take loads. So if I, for example, want to apply an area load to this entire kind of surface, then you'll see that I can't. 
What happens is in the structural analyze section, we're going to analyze and say, let's go for some loads. I can say, let's go through and put an area load on there. And what will happen is there's nothing to stick to because there's nothing that's considered to be a structural surface that would carry an area. So what you have to do is just go back over. If you go through and make it a structural surface, And now you come back in and you apply the loads. Okay, it can stick to that. So if you're having trouble getting your floor loads to stick, always just make sure that you have an analytical floor, you have a structural floor, and then it can stick to that. Now, if you have two different models and you have your you know, architectural model and your structural model doesn't have any floors in it, what you can do is just copy monitor the floors from the architectural model in and apply the loads there. Okay, so we can apply some loads, but let's talk about this in terms of loads and sort of what we want to apply. So you basically go through and notice there's only walls here. That's because there's no structural walls. If I turn them on, they would be available to. But I pretty much have this basic line model. I have basically a load that I've applied here. Let's talk about these guys down here before I talk more about the loads. These are boundary conditions. And let's talk about how boundary conditions work. Boundary conditions, let me take them out, just so you sort of see what they look like without them. Okay. As we look at our 3D model, you can say, hey, okay, these big foundation elements, these are going to act as boundary conditions. We're going to keep the thing from moving into the ground. But we actually need to add that in as an explicit analytical kind of piece. So what we can do is go to the analytical model and then choose boundary conditions. And you'll see you have point conditions, line conditions, and area conditions, depending upon whether you have a point load, a line load from a wall, or an area load from a big slab. As you choose the point condition, notice you also have the choice, is it fixed, is it pinned, is it a roller? And this has an impact in terms of really how it's going to be analyzed. Because things that are fixed go through and they provide some moment resistance. Okay, as opposed to just being pinned or rollered. Like if you pin them, it'll stop from moving down into the ground, but it can still sort of wiggle left and right. It can sort of like uh, skew a little bit, whereas fixed sort of says that it's gonna be a rigid connection and that's gonna be able to resist the moment. So again, you gotta think about your structural strategy. I'm gonna make them fixed right now which if I put it on all four corners makes it a little bit indeterminate, but then again, the finite element tools can go through and figure that out. So I'm going to basically apply the boundary conditions. Again, what you're doing is you're basically saying that as the loads are applied, this is where the point of resistance is going to happen. And I want to put boundary conditions on it in that if you try to analyze something without boundary conditions, there's no resistance. So it'll just move through space, and uh, you'll get a very big deflection. So some boundary conditions are the starting point. Next up is the issue of loads. Let's talk about loads. So again, I put a load on there, but here's how loads basically work. You have the choice of different types of loads. You have point loads, line loads, area loads, and hosted loads. The difference between a point or a, let's say a area load and a hosted area load is if you choose area load, you're basically going to draw a load. in a specific area. Okay. If you choose a hosted area load, you can just choose the floor and apply it that way. So it's really, if you want the entire boundary or you want to start doing a specific area. Generally what I'll do is I'll apply a load to the entire floor, sort of the entire dead load or kind of a uniform load throughout it, and then I'll draw loads as specific surcharges in specific high traffic areas or heavy equipment areas or something like that. But the nice thing about just doing a hosted area load is that if the structure size changes, if the beams change, it'll always, it'll, def it'll move, the load will sort of follow the air, the floor as it needs to. In terms of the magnitude of the loads, you can choose any of the loads and they have oh, X, Y, and Z components. 
So this lower one that I just selected right now, it looks like it's currently it's negative 0.05 kips per, per square foot. That's about 50 pounds per square foot. Okay, splitting straight down right now. If I wanted to make that 100 pounds, I'll just change the magnitude right there. Notice you also have categorizations. You have dead load, live load, wind, snow, temporary loads. If you change them, okay, it'll change its color. The idea here, though, is what you can do is load up the structure in a way that you know, you're basically keeping track of the loads here. Ultimately, all these loads get transferred to the analysis program, and you can adapt the loads and kind of change the loads over there. But it's really a question of whether you want to sort of keep track of the loads directly in the model here, or just apply them strictly in the structural program. But any loads you apply here will carry forward, so you can kind of just use this as a database to kind of keep track of everything and precisely how they're you know applied, so that you don't have to redo it in the structural program. So that's a very big load right there in the center. We gotta bring that down again. That's minus a thousand right now. So I'll say minus two. It's about 200 pounds per square foot right in the center there. Right. Now, the tool is actually fairly smart about understanding how things all transfer. So what's gonna happen is these loads are gonna be applied to the floor, because that's what they're hosted by. The floor, in turn, rests on the beam systems and the beams. So it'll pick up the loads and carry them through the beams to these outer beams. These outer beams will carry them down to the columns, ultimately down to the conditions. So it actually is pretty smart about what it's doing. As long as everything's connected, things are in pretty good shape. If things are a little bit disconnected, then it'll complain, and you'll sort of uh, get sort of uh, different complaints that things are unsupported or need a little bit of work. But generally what happens is for analyzing, what I'll try to do is do a couple different things. A, I'll check the supports, just make sure everything's supported. Let me pull that out of the way because actually I think it is there. Member support check is complete, no unsupported elements detected. So that's pretty good. Okay, making sure nothing's hanging loose in space. The other thing is I'll do is I'll check consistency. Okay, and again, the analytical and physical model, it's, they seem to be in sync with each other. These are good things just to check in advance, just to make sure before you pre-flight something and send it over towards where you want. Okay, so I know that zipped through it pretty quickly in terms of what's going on, but basically what you're gonna think about doing is just for a piece of your structure, going through and applying some boundary conditions and applying some loads, and then using this information to actually go through and size things up. So whether it's to size that beam or this beam or the beams in the middle. But generally it's to go through and just think about, oh, kind of a worst case scenario or a dominant case scenario, just something which is really gonna be, you know, something that'll give us a lot of information. And rather than trying to analyze everything in great detail, just trying to like go through and do a few things. So I've been working with this concrete structure You can sort of see it's kind of hanging around over here. The truth is, though, it's just the same. Actually, I can see I made a mistake over there. Check that out. The problem with drawing things is you're never quite sure where you're drawing them, especially in 3D. So let me fix this for you. I'll have to get rid of this guy here. And I'd say at level two, You draw the load. What I want to do is basically set the work plane to be level two so that it's actually drawn at level two. Okay, that would be more accurate. Watch out for 3D. 3D will always get you. Okay, that's truly at that level now. Okay, come back over here, minus 0 0.2. There's my surcharge there. Okay, 
Let's look at the uh, kind of steel structure though, just so you can sort of see that in a weird way, even though one structure is concrete and one structure is steel, What you're going to see is analytically they're just the same. Yes? Let's fix that. Just in time to see the steel come up. structure. It doesn't look very different from the other one because analytically it's about the same. There's the steel structure there. Notice this, that even though spatially we did go through and lower those beams, for example that beam is that minus five inches because I want it to be below the steel deck of the floor. Um, analytically it's all considered to be at the upper level and the reason that is is that we're going to consider basically the deck and the concrete to all be acting as one uniform sub. Yeah, it's, it's all resisting kind of uniformly. So the loads get transferred right up. So the analytical model looks about the same. Okay. But that's the big gist of really applying the different loads. The big thing is, again, turning on floors if necessary so you can carry loads, turning on any walls if you want to carry, with the boundary conditions and apply the loads, and then we're ready for analysis. So let us do this. Let us pause right now for five. And when we come on back, we're going to go through and take this over to, we can take two choice of tools. I'll take the robot structural. Are any of you really good with ETABS users? Anyone? Anyone? Any ETABS users? No ETABS users. Ah, we have an ETABS user. You can go ahead and tell us how to do it in ETABS. But I'll show you the same sort of thing. We'll take it to two different structures systems because it works out about the same okay let's do it so let's break for five and then come on back and when we do we'll do a little bit of analysis on this very basic structure because we want to figure out is really you know which of these beams do we think is really the one that are well, you know which are the ones that uh, might need to be upside like as you look at that structure just as you're leaving here now which beams do you think might be the most heavily loaded or the worst case scenario of all those different structural, of all those things? It's a long dimension horizontal. Okay. So, probably that one. If it was a choice between this one and that one, which one do you think is worse? Left hand. Left hand. And why is that one worse? This is carrying the joist. It's carrying the joist coming into it, so they're all carrying okay. So, I bet that's our dominant member right there. Of all the joists, which are the least uh, loaded ones right now? Aren't they uniformly loaded? Yeah. Well, they're all the same load across the floor area. So, given that, like, which of the which of the different uh, joists have the least area? The ones on the end. Yep. So, this is basically you know, back of the envelope thinking about the whole thing. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and pause, come back in five.